why we, this is why we gamble. All right. Ba, 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 ba. Uh, guys, I think we're here. I think we're live. Brand new Poker Live podcast. Sorry for the delay. I'm having some issues with my graphics card on my computer. I got a new, a new graphics card. My OBS, for some reason, is slipping a little bit here. Uh, it's been self-quarantine week on the Poker Live podcast. We've had Bill Perkins, uh, Doug Polk, Rob Young on this week. Great conversations with each three of those guys. Bill Perkins talking markets, talking how to deal with the coronavirus, talking about uh, how, how to process times in moments like this. Doug Polk, of course, said his goodbye to Poker World. Had a great conversation with him about what he's up to next. Yesterday, Rob Young, a more of a conversation featuring, you know, what's happening with the online Poker World, what's going to happen with the live Poker World. He's very interested in bringing back, uh, you know, that 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 stuff to online poker and live poker, making these great events and, and really giving back to the poker players. And today, we're talking with my man Timex, aka Mike McDonald. You guys know Mike McDonald. Uh, he's been in the poker world a very, 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 very long time. Uh, formerly one of the top tournament players, uh, very well known in the community, very respected player in the community. Transitioned to the business side of things with his website Poker Shares. He was always known for for taking bets on and uh, against players, and now he did that in an official legal capacity where it doesn't service American players, and uh, recently made some news on Twitter. I mean, if you've been following what's happened on Twitter, right, I think Mike's been tweeting out a lot. I've been tweeting out a lot. Doug Polk tweeting out a lot. A lot of people from the poker world are just tweeting out their thoughts, and, and Mike's had some really good takes, and, and he was one of the first people to really uh, put out there that the World Series poker might be canceled. Everyone kind of called him a fucking idiot. They're like, this guy's dumb. I go, listen... Timex wouldn't be listing the World Series of Poker being canceled if there wasn't a good chance that the guy thinks it's going to be canceled. So we're going to talk more about that and more uh, all about what's happening in the betting world and kind of figure out uh, just what Mike's thinking about the uh, what's happening right now. We're joined by Timex. What's up, brother? Welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Good. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Like, I mean, I guess I should say good, all things considered, mm -hmm. you know, it's, but it's, uh, yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's been an interesting, 2020 has been an interesting year. You know, know. I'll, I'll definitely say that it's been uh, it's been an eventful one. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a pretty wild ride so far out here, guys. And I am I'm streaming this by the way too. If there's some issues with it, I'm going to just upload the full recording on my end in better quality. Uh, but we're gonna try to make this happen. No gamble, no future around here, guys. But yeah, 2020 has been pretty crazy. Obviously, a lot of stuff's happened that's very newsworthy, and now we have this happening. And uh, What's kind of your, your thoughts on it from your perspective? Because you're in the betting world and you have sort of an opportunity to potentially position yourself to make some bets on what's happening. And you actually did that. And there was some backlash, right? Because what, what, was, the, what was the exact bet that you had to take down poker shares because people were a little upset about it? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit tough um, where it had to take down might be a bit of a stretch. You know, we probably had, you know, six or seven people make comments saying they didn't like it. And then after we took it down, we probably had, you know, 30 or 40 people say like, what the fuck are you doing? Like that should be up there, mm. uh, maybe more than 40. Um, and of those seven, you know, I don't think any of them have an account on poker shares and definitely none of them have been depositors on poker shares. So it's definitely, you know, and a couple of them, even after the fact said they were just trolling. Like mm. one of the comments that really stuck out to us was one guy's like, oh, uh, could you also make a, mem a market on which my family members dies next? And we were just like, you know, we were over there being like, wow, like, I guess if people do like that, you know, look at it that way, that, you know, it doesn't exactly make us look like the good guy. So, you know, we, we took it down based on a couple of comments. Um, and then that guy later said he was just trolling and he liked the market. Um, but basically we have, uh, yeah, so we, we took, we took down, the market was based on how many confirmed cases there would be at the end of March. Like, you know, as, as, you know, Bill mentioned, he's been, you know, very obsessed with the coronavirus as well. And he, you know, he was asking us for that market. He put it up and we just kind of like laughed it off. And then, you know, a, a, probably a dozen or maybe more people were like, yeah, what would your rates be? What would your, you know, what would the market be like? And we just thought, like, let's just see, like, we, we thought we would likely have some, you know, bad press from it, but we, we just figured we'll throw it up, see what people say. And then, you know, when we had some negative comments, uh, I was asleep at the time, but, you know, other guys within the company decided let's take it down. You know, I woke up, you know, something like 20 minutes later and I wish I could have gotten, you know, my, to have my voice heard. Um, but basically we, uh, yeah, we, the, the company decided to take it down. Oh, interesting. Okay. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I was surprised to see it. Even that, that tweet kind of went out, but it makes more sense now. A few people were upset and uh, I mean, it's a pretty serious thing, right? When you talk about people dying around the world, so I can understand why people would be upset or, I mean, they're trolling too as well too, but I mean, it kind of made, I don't know, 
bets like this get made all the time on different things, right? So it, it makes sense that, that you would put the bet out there. You would issue the bet, right? And then it kind of comes down, I guess, what is it, a moral thing, an ethical thing? I, do you want to bet on people dying? You know, Negreanu was, was I think Negreanu just chimed in because Doug Polk decided to make a bet. He wanted to bet, and he, you know, Negreanu wants to go after everything Doug Polk kind of does. So I think that's where Negreanu's tweet came out of, I don't bet on people dying. I don't bet on pandemics and stuff like that. So it, uh, I don't know. I thought it was interesting. Did you get a lot of action on, on the World Series poker being canceled? Or did you get a lot of people betting on this stuff at all? I, so I thought, no, like, so on the World Series getting canceled, I think I bet um, 2K plus half a Bitcoin to win, you know, 24K plus six Bitcoin, which, you know, it, it was pretty, you know, it was a higher stakes bet when I made it. And then the, the stakes of the bet shrunk in less than into half, basically, when Bitcoin went from, you know, 10K down to 4K. And then now, I guess today has been a good day for Bitcoin. So, you know, the stakes of the bet are growing at least, which is kind of nice. I, I wanted to bet, you know, maybe five five times that much or so. Uh, but there just, you know, there was a lot of people saying it's impossible and not a lot of people laying 12 to 1, I suppose. So, and, you know, maybe I could have gotten more action if I had kept push, pressing the line down 10 to 1, 8 to 1. Like, I really, you know, I, I was thinking at the time it was maybe a two and a half to one dog or something like that. And I mean, in hindsight, it's like, of course it's going to get canceled. Um, but, you know, I was thinking, yeah, maybe maybe two or three to one dog was was kind of where what I was thinking. So I just thought this is, a, you know, kind of a slam dunk uh, bet to make, I suppose. And then, you know, a lot of people bet on uh, a lot of people bet on uh, that. How many cases there will be by the end of the March? And we're definitely going to lose a decent amount of money on the market from on site where, you know, I think probably half people bet the over. Like the, I don't know, the market came out and price was, you know, plus 330 or something like that, if it, over 25,000. And then by the time the market got taken offline, it was plus 180 because people just kept on betting over, over, over. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely one where we're going to lose. I mean, we'll, we'll lose a lot or anything, but yeah, so that was, that's what ended up happening there where, you know, pretty quickly, you know, it, it seemed like America was, you know, very much suppressing numbers not giving up tests and you know really the last kind of week or so so it's pretty clear that they're going to be testing and you know we'll probably end march with you know our highest our highest tier was over twenty five thousand. we'll probably end march with over a hundred thousand i would guess wow um which yeah it's kind of it's it's really ramping up right yeah i mean I, you know then this is kind of what if it comes out in three months from now that it was actually more cases than they thought right like what if what if they go back and retroactively test some things. I mean, I don't know what they have. If they have people that maybe passed away or if they have people that were sick that got tested. What if they develop some tests that goes back and retest those things and said, oh my God, we actually had a million cases during that time, but we only had, we only knew this at the time because we only had so many tests available. So it's kind of a, so you, you had more action on the under 25,000 cases total for March. Yeah. So we basically, we had four tiers. I think it was under 5,000, 5 to 12,000, 12 to 25,000, and over 25. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, hardly anyone bet under 5,000 and hardly anyone bet uh, 12 to 25,000. Okay. Popular bets were in the 5 to 12,000 and the over uh, 25,000. That makes sense. So it's like, yeah, you know, I think we might already be over 12,000 or something. So, you know, people would have lost those bets. But, you know, it's, yeah, it, it really, for whatever reason, everybody was like, oh, it's not a big deal, 5 to 12 or this shit's going to go wild over 25. Like no one really, yeah, went in that 12 to 25 range or whatnot. So yeah. it was, uh, and they, uh, yeah, just kind of went, uh, yeah, went crazy there. And then, you know, we took it down, I don't know, 10 hours after we put it up or something like that. So that, uh, that uh, ended that, I suppose. Yeah, shout out to everybody watching. We are on self-quarantine week, guys. We're live on YouTube. We're live on Twitch right now. All my podcasts are also going to be on iTunes. Tomorrow, we're putting up a video, The State of poker in America, where you can play. I've been doing a lot of research. Been, I probably spent about eight to 10 hours this past uh, yesterday. I, I was deep in the lab talking with talking with all sorts of people. Whenever I do these research projects, Mike, about where people should play and just in general what's happening, I just end up talking with the craziest fucking people that you would just, you'd be like, are you sure you're gonna listen to that guy? I'm like, I'm listening to everybody. Whatever you guys got to say about these sites, about what's happened out there. Give me all your craziest theories that you got. I really want to hear them, right? One, what I got a message last night from a guy, um, you know, I want to name, I, I won't name him, I guess, but he said, I think one of the apps is mining cryptocurrency. And I said, and he starts showing me graphs about the, the statistics and how the, and much energy the computer's using. And he, it was for the PP poker thing. He said, I think it's mining crypto. I said, well, I really don't even know what that means. So I, I guess I got I got Now I got to research what that means. You ever heard about this, Mike? Where, cause I know you're obviously you're huge in the crypto space. 
You ever heard of the programs you download and in the background it mines for crypto? Is that a, is that a big thing? Yeah, it's yeah, it's I mean, it's definitely a big thing. And I think it was I think it was bigger back in the day where it's just, uh, you know, back in the day when there was so little competition for mining, you know, these days, these days, you know, these ASIC miners are just so powerful relative to your computer that, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe on your computer, you're making like a 10th of a penny an hour, or, you know, something crazy, something that definitely won't even come close to covering like the electricity bill. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's yeah, back in the day before people got good at mining Bitcoin, I used to hear, you know, a decent amount of stories where it's like, you know, you, some website is mining it or like some malware you get on your computer. Right. Know, I think there have been a, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of kind of viruses designed just to steal your computer's unused resources and mine Bitcoin, uh, which is pretty incredible. It's an incredible degree of, you know, organization and to kind of steal something from someone that they don't know is being stolen, if that makes sense. Like yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of crazy. So I, 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 I think it's possible, but it sounds a little far-fetched. Right. I mean, that's what most of these things always sound to me, right? Whenever someone gives me a theory like that, that doesn't make, you know, on the surface, it doesn't seem possible, right? You never really know. And, and a lot of times you got to dig deep. And then even if you find out what's happening either way, it doesn't necessarily make that big a difference too. So it's just, you kind of have to pick your battles in terms of what holes you go down and research. And uh, I, I guess, what do you, what are you spending your most time on right now interested in, right? Because you got poker shares and you're obviously tweeting a lot about the, the coronavirus and you're you're tweeting a lot about cryptocurrency as well, too. Where are you spending a lot of your efforts and your energy right now on, uh, on your interest? Yeah, so I mean, I guess uh, I guess right now I've just sort of had, you know, yeah, coronavirus has been sort of the main thing. You know, I was kind of, I was following the Democratic primaries quite a bit, but, you know, it seems like they're kind of over, I suppose. And, you know, short of, you know, Biden getting coronavirus. Um, and Is I that think on the website? That, Pardon me? No, that's not, oh, that's okay. not on the website, but you know, I think that's, that's more likely than, you know, that's more likely to, you know, if something happens that, you know, changes that, like from, that's, you know, probably one of the only things that could really change it, I guess. Um, and then, you know, yeah, I've been, I've been, the chess candidates started a couple of days ago. So I, I was, oh. I've been looking forward to the chess candidates for like four or five months or whatnot, but like coronavirus is just so, uh, so much more, like notable, I suppose that I'm barely even watching. Like normally, when these big chess tournaments go on, I wake up early and watch them, watch the commentary, analyze the games and shit. And it's just like I've, you know, I've, I haven't really been focused on uh, chess the last few months. Um, chess candidates, huh? So, I like, I like, I like where we're going with this. Just, uh, chess candidate. Yeah. You got candidates. Yeah, you got ch chess candidates. You, you got get, candidates lined you up. Eight, for some you chess get eight matches, candidates huh? to play. It, it, Magnus has a Magnus has a pretty good life. He sits up there on his throne, and he's got eight candidates who want to come play chess with him. Like. Who would who wouldn't want eight people to go? You know, eight options for who would like to play chess with you. This sounds like The Bachelor. The yeah, Bachelor yeah, for exactly. chess. This is going great. We need to start. We maybe, maybe. I mean, I don't know about you. Are you a single guy, Mike? Right now, you you got. Uh, your... No, no, not a single guy. Oh, uh, no, well, no. Bo both of us aren't going to be playing. Aren't going to be having our chess our candidates lined up then. So we're we're both <laughs> yeah, uh... we've taken uh, taken time uh, time away from these uh, candidate matches. Yeah. That's true, man. Yeah, it sounds, uh, you know, actually what happened was interesting before before I tweeted this up, right? I, I always like, anytime I have you on the podcast, I like to share the classic clip of you versus Jamie Gold, right? And yeah. I, so I, I'll put this up on the screen now for people. I shared th this, right? I said, I still watch, I watch this clip before every podcast we've done, still one of the greatest. And then Jamie Gold said, I wish your favorite moment Watching before every podcast was not one moment where I was so tilted, acted most inappropriately, and reacted so poorly. We live and learn and grow, thankfully. I have great respect for you. Never got to know him, but certainly was outplayed by him. And then you said, appreciate you reaching out. I was a jerk, too, in that moment, even though he did at the time. The memory of that is still one of the highlights of my career. Now, I got to say, I'm a little surprised that Jamie Gold said that because I thought this was great. I'm like, this is what kind of made poker fun, right? Like Jamie Gold was sort of that, mm -hmm. that, that like villainous personality and some, even though I loved, I, I loved watching the guy play. I didn't really take him that Me way, too. but yeah. I thought it's hilarious, man. It's so fucking funny. You're like, what's your name online? He's like, I'm Jamie Gold right here. I mean, that's hilarious to me. So I was surprised to hear him have more of like a regretful tone with, with, with that whole scene that went down that hand. I found that a little surprising. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, it's 12 and a half years in the making and like I, I've, I've never heard him comment on the hand until today. You know, I've never, you know, I don't think I ever played with him again. I don't think I ever, maybe I've seen him 
at the Rio once or twice over that time. Like, I don't play much of the series. He doesn't play much of the series. Like, I just haven't, you know, haven't met him. It was just, like, something that happened. And it made it, it made it almost more substantial because we never ended up at the same table again or never ended up in the same tournament. Mm-hmm. And to add to what you said about, you know, enjoying watching him play, it was, you know, for, so for me, I, I first played poker late 2004, and I didn't find, uh, I didn't really find tournament poker until early 2006. So, you know, I never, I never watched the money i never watched money maker i never watched hashem you know it was just like it was like 2000 like i i got into playing tournaments early 2006 and was playing high stakes tournaments by mid 2006 and it was just like i was all my friends were down you know were down in vegas you know playing playing stuff and whatnot and it was just like i was you know like a fucking 16 year old kid at home watching and like watching you know, watching the 2006 main event was, it was about the most I've ever watched live poker. And like seeing, seeing this all go down was just, you know, it was madness. And it was, you know, I, I remember watching on this little shitty old laptop I had, like I was, my parents wanted me to kind of get out of the house so go up to their cottage or whatnot. And I was playing on a little fucking TV table or whatnot. Just like, mm-hmm. you know, the, t- the table is probably the size of a normal size laptop or whatnot. And just sitting there on their like shitty 2006 internet. You know, my parents are doing like walks down near the beach. And I'm like over there like watching, you know, Jamie Gold playing the 2006 main event while hoping the internet dial up internet or whatnot doesn't cut out. So it was, yeah, no, it's like, it's, it's a throw, it's a throwback, but like definitely watching, watching the, you know, the, the old, the old school days is, it was so fun back then. And even, even kind of my era, I was coming up, you know, starting to playing live more 2007 to 2010, a lot of the trash talk was gone by then. Like people see, people see this hand and they think, oh, wow, like everyone was trash talking in 2007. But a lot of that trash talk was the 2003, 2005 era poker. Like it, it, it didn't, you know, the people shit talking like that. Like it was, it was out of character. Like I don't know if I've ever gotten in another trash talking about like that at the table in, yeah. in my whole career. Like it was, it was just a funny, yeah, it was just a funny, um, I, I was heated. He was heated. You know, it was, it was a funny, uh, funny event, but yeah, no, it's while going back and watching it. It's great. Yeah. I'm very curious people watching out there. Did you actually watch Jamie gold? Right. Because in, in my, it's very vivid, the memories for me, but have people out there, the newer fans of poker. Have you guys seen any of the old school World Series poker moments? Did you watch Jer- Jerry Yang? Did you watch the Jamie Gold years? Have you guys actually seen that? Or do you really have no idea about what exact, cause like going back in that history, right? It was such like a, there wasn't much content out there, right? So you had these characters, as you mentioned, a lot of trash talk and you had these like fucking battles, man. You had like, what, what was, <laughs> Who was the guy, Sean Shakan? He was like, uh, yeah. wasn't he like, didn't he like, was he trying to almost got into a fight with somebody during one of these shows? Maybe there was more than one person that almost got into a fight with, I think, right? Like Eric well, yeah, Molina Hel- and people? Uh, Hel- yeah, Helmuth got into a fight. What's his name? That uh, Sam Grizzle knocked Helmuth out, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, no, I think I think he just like, well, I wonder if there's a video of this, but I think they just took it outside the casino, clocks him and knocks him out. Like it's, uh, let me see if I can find, I don't know if this is on video or not, but there's, uh, I've never seen this. If this is on video, I've never, I've never seen this video in my life. Yeah. Let me see if there's, uh, I don't know. So if, if there is someone will find it, this would be, this would be like really old, like, you know, 2000 or something like that. But maybe someone, if there's a video of someone in the chat probably knows about it, if not the stories around online, but yeah, shit used to get, get used to get crazy. Yeah, man. It's uh it's a lot different. Obviously now, now it's more just less talking, right? Less animation, less giving, giving away information sort of thing like that. You still have Daniel working his magic and working his mojo and, and getting his reads off people in terms of how he does it because he's, he's an expert at doing it, but we don't really see that too often for the most part. Now it's just kind of quiet side, which we could say, right? That's probably the way it should be because when you are talking and when you're acting animated, you're giving off a lot of information. And now, as we know, every, everything you do at the table conveys information so I think people are just more wary about that, especially after they've seen Daniel Grano's ad on YouTube approximately 25 million times. So it's, it's I mean, it's all over. The, I mean, you, I'm curious how many people out there, how many times have you seen Daniel Grano's masterclass ad? And I know the smart assets are going to say zero. You have ad blocker. I get it, right? But I don't use ad blocker. I support the ads. So, um, um, but yeah, Jamie Gold apologizing, man. Very, uh, we got to get that guy in the pot. I don't, I don't really know too much about the guy, man. I just know he... He was like, a, a, he shaped the poker world and literally had some of the most legendary moments in the history of televised poker with high stakes poker and with the World Series poker main event runs. So it's like he had, 
I would argue that he had one of the greatest like three year runs in the history of poker. Now, now of course Tom Dwan, Phil Ivy, right? They're going to be up there. Those guys legends. But I would argue that Jamie Gold's run when he won that main event and then was just on high stakes poker, uh, it, it was buying for a million. It was like buying for a million dollars or something like that. And yeah. Just like these these hands he was getting into, it was just like. It was, yeah, it was madness. And just eat the tra the table talk, like the, you know, I said top, top. No, no, chop, chop. No, no, top, top. Like, you know, it was, it was, it was wild. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a crazy era. And it's sort of, you know, so a lot of the guys that, you know, won big tournaments back then were playing unconventional styles, but his was, his was total madness. You know, it was, you know, and it, it's like a lot of, a lot of the stuff probably against how tight people were, like was legitimately good. And, you know, some of it maybe not so good, but it was, you know, it was just such a, you know, it, it's like, I'll be, like, basically, I, I think if you were to go watch film on how Stu Ungar used to play back in 1980, it's basically Jamie Gold. You know, like, it's, you know, it's just that, you know, that sort of just like absolute madness style. That's probably why, you know, everyone talks about, you know, Stu Ungar not being much of a cash game player or whatnot, because like, hey, you know, you just call. You know, right. but it's just, you know, I think that, I think that the, the style that worked against those, you know, ultra tight players who are, you know, playing for too much money, you know, the, a lot of the things that were, were done there, even though they're, they might not be uh, solver approved were, <laughs> were things that, uh, you know, they, it, they worked for a reason, I suppose. Yeah, it's a good point, right? Like, uh, I mean, you find that now it's just the weaker players typically are going to be worse at handling aggression because they're just not, they're, they're uncomfortable in those spots or their mental game's not strong enough or they haven't studied it or played it or thought about it enough. But now, obviously, as the average player gets better, then they understand how to play against that aggression. And that's a real big difference between your medium tier players and your weaker players against your great players is that those great players can put the aggression on you and can also know how to play against it. You mentioned Stu Unger, right? 1980. No one was studying the, I, we just read Super System the other night, right? Like there wasn't really any, like, like uh, actually we need to get to chapter three of the Super System. We didn't go through the Hold'em specific strategy. Maybe it did talk about being hyper aggressive, but you got to imagine a guy comes in there running and gunning, raising a bunch of hands, playing a bunch of spots. What do you, like, what's your adjustment going to, where are you going to go? You don't know what to do because no one, you ever seen it before, man. Whereas now, right, we're used to seeing these, these sort of uh, kamikaze tournament style aggressive, just run up a big stack or kind of bust out pretty early. It seems like that's a, that's a tournament strategy. Some players, did you kind of have that strategy when you were, when you were at, at the peak of your grind or were you more of a guy who was saying, okay, let me, you know, let me kind of switch up gears a little bit, but let me try to get into money and then kind of go from there. I would say, I would say a bit of both like in, uh, so I think early on, um, 2007, 2008, 2009, I was usually trying to be table captain uh, where, you know, Anties add up to so much. You'd get so many old guys per table. People were folding lots. So it was the first couple of years, I think I was really aggressive. And then you got to the era where like really aggressive was on a next next level. Like when the Cal four two six eight eights and the Chris Olivers and like the real the really hyper aggressive style became common. And you know during that era, I think I played quite snug. Um, where you know not tight tight, but definitely was not. You know if you if you get at a table with you know with a Chris Oliver type, like if you're not willing to put in that, you know, eight bet with East four off, like he's putting in the seven bet with queen three off, you know? So it's like, you know, it's just like in that era, you really need to, you know, you can either, you know, you can either join the poof flinging or you can just kind of sit back and wait for good cards. So I think then kind of early 2010s, I was, you know, more, I think more snug for a pro and then kind of into the, you know, 2013 type era, like especially in main events, I was pretty insane. Like I think I I had pretty tight stats online, um, tighter than a lot of people. But definitely, I think a lot of people just thought like, oh, he's a nit. And then like when I would, you know, when I would play with people in main events, especially if they play, I know the guy's a good pro, plays hundred average buy-in online. And now I'm playing a five k with him. You know, I was just like super willing to pull the trigger on people and just kind of bluff the spots people don't expect you to bluff and just uh, yeah, like it kind of keep it keep it solid when you're at the you know tables with the elite pros and then just kind of find the right spots to be a madman i suppose so i think that you know i, I think i always tried to um maybe over adjust to my image i suppose when people thought i was really you know it's, it's simple but when people think you're the tight guy you know go crazy when you can get away with it when people think you're the crazy guy go tight and then you know in main events and stuff once you've had so much success when i was one of the biggest 
winners on the EPT and one of the biggest winners in the world for a couple of years. I know that, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the weaker pros won't want to go to war with me, especially if they're playing at stakes that are kind of above their comfort zone. Mm. So I think, you know, in, in those spots, I was, yeah, like kind of selectively hyper aggressive, but usually more solid, I guess. So you, you think that you had a pretty good feel for, for how, comfortable other players who may have been good were so you could kind of tell if they were feeling if they were uncomfortable and then then you could come up with exploits in those situations against those type of players yeah like i, I think that they're got you know i think uh, you know i think someone like uh someone like an adrian matios i think is one of the best examples of this where he's you know he's a very good uh, you know a very good poker you know a very good tournament poker player but an exceptional main event Hmm. You know, maybe, you know, I was talking with Negrano about this recently, and you know, maybe the best kind of thing. And you know, I think, I think for me, it might be similar to that, where maybe I'm a, uh, you know, a little worse at tournament poker than him, and a little worse at main events than him, but you know, similar categories, I suppose. Where you know, I think if I, you know, was, I think there were probably times when I would have been, you know, a top five main event type player, uh, but probably never a top five in a super high roller kind of thing. Interesting. Okay, I guess isn't that like a Helmut thing they say where Helmut's good against against like the weaker competition, but then you put him against the elite competition. And, and even though we could argue, he's got some pretty decent results. Some of these high rollers, right? I'm, I, I'd be willing to argue the other side. Obviously poker shares would be willing to, to, uh, mark down Phil Helmy. If I believe if you want to buy a piece of him on poker shares during some of these high roller events, but I guess that's a common thing. And, and it makes sense, right? If you are, if you're not one of the, uh, the top of the top players, of course, you're going to struggle against those high roller players, but if you have a really great strategy playing against average and weaker competition, which I think a lot of great players do, then that would make sense why you would do better in a type of field like that. And, you know, we could debate, right? Like who's, who's the better poker player in some ways, right? Like does the, does the high roller guy, is he going to be able to do as well in that field because he's so used to playing against the, the best players? Is he going to be able to take advantage of those guys the most and have the highest ROI? Obviously it's really impossible to know in a lot of ways, unless you have a real large sample, but it's one of those things in poker that I think we both love where you can, we, you, we, we can at least have a discussion about it, right? It's not like we go to a, a computer program and we say, oh, the program says this, that's the answer. We could at least debate back and forth in terms of uh, what the best style is or what the best players are equipped for those big fields. And really with poker for tournaments right now, man, it seems to be a pretty glorious time, right? There's so, well, there was, not anymore, I'm sorry. Take that back, but... It was that now it's all going online, but it still seems to be a place where anyone can win, right? You can be a weaker player and, and you can make some money for yourself, man. You don't need to be super studious to be able to, to, to be able to beat tournament poker. Yeah. I mean, especially if you find, you know, soft games or whatnot, you know, it's just, yeah. And it, it's just kind of, you know, most of it, most of the value comes from, you know, understanding how to beat the bad players, hold their own against the good players kind of thing. So yeah, that's uh yeah, there and a lot of the guys that spend so much time obsessing over beating the best get so far removed from like just the types of mistakes that the bad players make. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, what you're, what, uh, what you're describing, right? I remember I was reading uh, some someone on on two plus two. I made a post and they talked about uh, the conversation was like if if could I, could like being a winning player in 2020, right? And I said, do you understand how easy it is to be a winning player in 2020 if you understand game selection and understand how to take advantage of weaker players? If you can identify who's weaker than you and understand how you can take advantage of those players, it's pretty hard to not be a winning player in 2020 with some game selection. And I think you bring up a good point, right? A lot of players think that to be winning poker players, they need to beat the best players. When in reality, you don't need to beat the best players. You need to beat the players that you play with. And if those players are weaker than you, then you just have to get a little bit better than them. So it's really that simple in a lot of ways, but it can be this complex thing where it's very hard to, to really grasp for a lot of players out there that don't, you know, it's, it makes sense to, I think, us because we played so much, but to other players, they just, you know, but yeah, but I, 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 how do I find those games? And, and really, it's, it's not very difficult these days. Yeah, no, I think that's, no, I think that's a good point you raised that, yeah, you, you just need to be, you just need to be better than the bad players and you need to, you need to find the bad players and you need to get to play with them. You know, that's, that's the, that's half the battle. But your, your goal for yourself when you were playing, cause I, you don't, you don't get to become one of the best players in the world without wanting to become one of the best players in the world. Right. So when you set out, why did you, what, why was that the goal for you when, when you decided to, to try to achieve that? Um, sorry, what's sorry? What's the exact question? Why? What? Why? Like, what was the motivation? Why did you decide you wanted to become one of the best players in the world? 
right? What did, was there someone that you looked up to that you said, okay, this is what I want to be like, or was, was your poker dream to become one of the top tournament players in the entire world? Or like what, why exactly motivated you to, to put in that much effort to, to get to that position? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess for me, you know, I like games in general and, you know, I hadn't really found anything, you know, with school or potential jobs or anything that seemed like something I was overly passionate about. And I just kind of like, picked up poker as a hobby and quickly, you know, for me, it wasn't like, I never really kind of dreamt about like winning a bracelet or anything. I was just like, fuck, like I can make a bunch of money and not have to get a job. Like, you know, that was, that was a lot of it where it's just like, you know, at the early stages, I was like, Hey, I don't, I might not need to get a part-time job. You know, at the later stages, it's like, Hey, I might not need to stick with school. <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't, I, I think I had already, you know, it, I, I was, I'd probably been playing, you know, like very, you know, poker very seriously for several years before I even considered like, oh yeah, this is kind of like a job or something. So it's just like, you know, it just seemed like something that I find fun that you can make money doing. And then, you know, I, I didn't, I think a lot of people um, sort of get more pride out of uh, kind of climbing the ladder. Like, you know, like, like, and I guess what I sort of mean by that is like when you had, when you had, once you added super high rollers to the circuit, you kind of had this, you know, everybody needed to sell action. So you could sort of see this almost like hierarchy of who gets to sell action. You know, if you can sell at a 4% premium, someone else can sell at a 10%. Okay, they're above you on the ladder. Mm. If your other friends that you think are good, they can't sell at all. And okay, they're below you on the ladder. And it's like, prior to that, I hadn't even really thought that much about sort of where I might stand. So, you know, even though I always thought, you know, I was very good, you know, I, I didn't really, I never really thought like, you know, 2009, 2011, you know, in those kind of three super high roller eras, I never really thought, am I a top 10 player? Am I a top 50 player? Like, you know, I thought there's, you know, a couple hundred good MTT players. And I thought, you know, I'm definitely in that group. And, you know, we're all, every single person in that group probably thinks they're above average in that group. And I'm aware of my own biases. So, you know, I never, I never even like thought that much about where, where I would sort of fall. And then it's sort of like once we started having more super high rollers and it's like, hey, I can sell to these and a lot of my friends can't and like, oh, you know, winning some of these and, you know, and seeing yourself kind of climb up the career earnings list and, you know, things, you know, see like, oh, the TV, you know, the, the TV cuts put me in a more favorable light than the average pro, like, you know, kind of, you know, 2012, 2013 sort of era, like I sort of started even considering, oh, like maybe I am like one of the best at this, but like I, I never throughout the earlier you know, throughout the earlier part of, you know, winning my EPT and, you know, all that stuff, I, I just didn't really think that. I never, it, it just wasn't really, you know, being better than the other good pros, it just wasn't really on my radar. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I think my motivation was different than a lot of people. I just liked the game and was trying to make money at the game and kind of improving came along with that, but didn't, didn't really, you know, I would kind of compare myself more to myself than to other people and just sort of be like, oh, I'm playing a lot better than I was six months ago, but not being like, oh, like, I want you made a you played a hand bad. I'm better than you. Kind of, right. You know there was you know so it, yeah it was tough to yeah it was a, a, just a different headspace than a lot of people I suppose. That's very interesting, right? And I think I I always thought about it that way is that it was a battle against myself and that if I could execute my strategy, I, I was most likely to win at the game. And I try to keep getting better and better and better, just compared to myself. I never really looked at anyone else and said, oh this person's good or not. I just was like everyone's sort of you know probably bad, right? I should have thought more about what other people were doing, but I'm like, if I just execute my strategy, I know I'm going to win, right? I'm just, I got to work hard at it. I got to stay focused. I can't tilt my mind off and I can't start going crazy with a bunch of random hands and have these big losing sessions. And, and I, I asked that question because I've been studying what the current landscape is of poker in America specifically. And I think like the way I always viewed poker and, and what was appealing to it and why I wanted to climb so hard and, and, you know, that's why I asked that question is because it seems like that's not really the dream anymore now for people. And that's not necessarily a possibility because now it's, you kind of have to, sh like you, the goal is to play the soft games right now. The goal is to just, yeah. I need to find the best games. And it seems like that is what the dream is. It's like, oh my God, I got in this amazing soft game with a couple guys who don't know what the fuck they're doing. They have a lot of money to spend and they let me in the game. I get to play the game or I organize the game kind of seems like that's where the dream is going for a decent percentage of the American poker player right now. Whereas you still have some of those tournament players. And I think their goal, they travel around and they, and they have different goals, but I just found this fascinating. It was something I really never realized until I started digging more into it. Now 
And, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe I, not, not very appealing to me personally, right? Like, can we find some guys to fleece? That's not very hard to do. It's pretty easy to do, right? But becoming yeah. a player at the highest stakes, now that's hard to do because you actually have to beat some good players along the way to get there. And mm-hmm. you can at least understand that as you're going. Like, you might not think much about where you where you stack up against them, but you understand to get to that level, you got to beat, beat these other great players. And I think I always really enjoyed that challenge, but it doesn't seem like that challenge is necessarily there much anymore for for some of these guys they don't even realize that that's a possibility because their their image of the game is i need to game select to to be able to win that's what that's what i got to do well i mean the, the one thing i would say is kind of a counterpoint to that is you know during the you know during sort of like the you know glory days of online poker you know let's say 2005 to 2012 type range or whatnot you had all these guys you know, in the spotlight playing Rail Heaven, you know, taking part in the Dirt Challenge, you know, going and, you know, battling 25, 50 or higher on Stars and Full Tilt. You know, this was this was a big part of, like, you know, what was visible within poker. But then you also had guys, you know, they would play on 888, they would play on Paradise right. Poker, they would play on On Game and just silently make, you know, seven figures a year, stay out of the spotlight and just, you know, absolutely crush. And it's just like the idea that you're playing, you know, 100 200 or 200 400 with all eyes on you doesn't mean you're clearing more at the end of the year than you know than some like 10 20 player who's winning you know 12 big blinds per 100 just you know massacring people and never having a downswing over 100k or whatnot and it's like so i i think a lot of people you know they when they remember the history of online poker they sort of they think about the guys who were kind of in the spotlight right but a lot of the the biggest winners of our um industry were the guys away from the spotlight so you know those guys fit more into the category of that sort of you know what the you say the current american players were like well in reality you know you had a few guys you know doug Polks and you know jungle mans and guys who kind of you know rose to stardom while playing in the toughest games but you also had a lot of guys who probably had careers that were you know on that degree of success who just got it quietly and you know aren't really remembered in the history book but you know just passively you know I, I, there was one pro i heard of every single every single time he made a million dollars playing online poker he'd retire the mouse and one time like he had a friend of his over opened up just had a, a drawer full of mice it was like you know my friend didn't count it was like 16 mice or something like that and it's just like this is you know it's a dude if you know if i were to say the name you'd probably remember the name or whatnot but a lot of people don't remember him as you know one of the like not top thousand you know, famous players probably just made, you know, $16 million playing online poker. You really, know, it's just really like, point. yeah. And it's just like, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of guys like that uh, out there who just kind of, you know, got the dollars without getting, you know, the following or whatnot. So, so it's like, I think, I think that the dream of just making money in soft games, it's always been there. I suppose. Right. It's a really good point, Mike. And that's actually something that I've been trying to think more about because that was never, never the way I personally viewed it because I came up watching the ESPNs and watching rail heavens and watching all these really well-known guys with their red names as as the professionals. I was like, Oh, I want to be like those guys, man. You know, I didn't, I didn't even really realize that you could be undercover and just, and just kind of going about your business. But I got a lot of friends and you got a lot of friends. I'm sure I've known people over the years that, that, that do just that and have done just that. Then you can debate what's better, what's worse. And I think it's a subjective thing in terms of what you want to do. But it does seem like now is that there's really like the way to go upon doing it. If we say our goal is to do that, be undercover, make money. Well, why would you ever want anyone to know you're good at the game, right? Before there was, there was some, there was some reason, right? To get recognition because with that recognition came opportunity, but now it seems like the recognition actually can work against you in some capacity in that it might hold you out of some games. Now, once you get to a certain point, like where I'm at, I get invited to the craziest fucking games I've ever seen, right? So it kind of almost works. Eventually, if you're like, okay, if you're just like a known person in the community, then people just want to play with you. Like Garrett Adelstein, he could probably get into a lot of games because people just might want to play with the guy. It's like playing with them. Doug Polk, you get to games, they just want to play with Doug. So I find that fascinating where it's like, then you can get to a point where you do have a lot of opportunity. But for a lot of players, if you're known as a good player, like that's pretty bad and yeah, you're yeah. going to get out of it. You're you, if, like, if, if, and then even if you're not good, if you're just known as a good player, they might start spreading the word around. Like, Hey, no, that guy's good, man. Let's keep him the fuck out of here. So yeah. it, it, it's a tough space. So now it's like, why would you want to necessarily get above the radar? Right. E- even though some people are, they're like their superstar in, in the, the 25 person telegram chats that are existing out there, but it's just much different now. Right. I, I just, I kind of find it interesting how the games evolved in a lot of ways here. 
yeah no the the ecosystem is sort of is it's always changing i suppose and you know i i definitely do think that you know this is something i've kind of been saying for a while regarding you know turnouts at the wsop and the state of poker and stuff like that like i think that you know if we look at how poker's grown in the last you know six seven years or whatnot i think that speaks more to you know the global economy than it does to actual interest in poker you know there's more people that just have 10 grand burning a hole in their pocket that they want to go spend in a poker tournament you know i think that you know i think here you know we're we're, we're likely leading up to you know a couple of years of not great financial times and i think that if poker can fight persist through that and stay very popular it's a great sign but you know i think there is also room that you know that these guys could go you know dust off five grand a night in a five five game or something you know i think I think a lot of guys like that, you know, wherever their money comes from, you know, where it's it, like every business is going to get hurt kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, I think there's just going to be a lot less dead money floating around, uh, you know, a year from now than there is today. So, you know, I think, you know, it'll be, inter- it'll be interesting to see, like, once we, you know, make it through all this, you know, if economy is hitting all time high five years from now or something like that, it'll be interesting to see, like, where where the dust settles i suppose you know i i'm kind of i'm a little bit bearish on yeah just the amount of wrecks playing high stakes where you know nobody's really going to be making any money kind of thing it's a good point mike mentioned about the economy i think that's something you've you've brought up to me on twitter kind of uh over uh, at one point in time because i remember i I think think there was some some exchange we had like a year ago or something yeah i I think i think you're the one that brought that up right you got you can't you can't factor out the economy right with with the cryptocurrency the rise of crypto and 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 us being in a good economy here in america that makes sense why you'd see more people have more income and obviously now as business is getting shut down and the smaller businesses are getting shut down and only these big corporations are being open right now in america that's obviously going to impact that that you know the middle class a person who had this extra money to go gamble with and play with too so right that would be interesting to see exactly what develops and what takes place with that uh yeah i mean that's you know you think about the future of poker right now it appears that the future of poker is not live poker in any setting and it's only going to be online poker now with that comes a lot of opportunity for people up there to make money and a lot of opportunity for people to get scammed and a lot of opportunity for people to lose a lot of money too. So I'm a little worried about what's going to take place here because I'm already seeing like the ecosystem with these apps and the ease of ability to find an agent, right? Like these guys are, are like telemarketers. They're cold calling people. Hey, you want to sign up? You want to sign up? You want to sign up? Like, yeah, people want to gamble, right? They, they, they sure. I'll send you 500 bucks on PayPal. Put me on there. So I'm a little worried about what's going to take place here with the with the future of poker, but we got some great options out there too as well for uh, for tournaments, for party poker, for for uh, I mean you know poker stars, right? I think they still put on some great events too and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, right? Yeah, I mean I think online poker is only going to get bigger and bigger during this period of time while everyone's at home. Yeah, no, I think we're going to have a crazy online poker boom for the next you know you know whatever three to eighteen months kind of thing. And I think that I think basically, yeah, the, to add to those clubs, you know, I think it's I think it's important for people to you know realize that this stuff is, you know, is just very clearly illegal. <laughs> and, you know, and you de- like as as people like play on these sites, keep balances on these sites, like be mindful that, you know, at any point, you know, the rug could get swept out from under your feet where, you know, I think people would just uh, people probably benefit from just, you know, keep keep a buy-in or keep five buy-ins or keep an amount of money that like if it were gone tomorrow you're you're not going to miss it too much on you know on these apps on these sites where it's just you know there's you know it's not you know the 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 extent to which scams are going to occur even assuming there are no legal issues is going to be rampant and then throw in some legal issues throw in you know if if government ever freezes a bunch of this or whatever it happens to be you just you you want to be you want to be somewhat careful and i'm not saying totally avoid those apps like especially if you're a serious poker player you know whether professional or just you know very hobbyist poker player I, you know i think it's to- uh, totally fine to go this route but just like yeah be mindful of the fact that like the you know uh, how some of these you know companies have been able to you know like, operate illegally in the states is just they've never really gotten big enough that it becomes an issue for them and uh and they just kind of yeah, I mean, if, if, if too many dollars are, uh, are are moving hands or whatnot, there's there's always room that, you know, the DOJ or someone kind of wants to step in. And, you know, it seems like this is going to boom. And, yeah, just don't don't keep too big of a balance would be my main 
uh, recommendation to people. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, right? If you're going to play, it seems to be there's micro stakes, small stakes, right? If you want to play, most likely you're not going to win at the game anyway. So why not just play those lower stakes, right? Put some money on there you can afford to lose. Obviously, we know it's not going to be the case for a lot of people out there. They're going to they're gonna gamble with money. They they want to win a bunch of money, right? They think they're better than... I mean, I don't, I, I'm kind of trying to figure more of that out, right? Like what, what leads somebody who has you know, $3,000 to take $1,000 of that and go play some two five on an online poker site when they don't, can't win at poker. You know what I mean? Like what, what, what leads that guy to kind of go do that? So it's going to be, uh, I guess I'm going to have a video coming up more about this tomorrow, but I think that's really good advice, right? Just, just be careful what balance you leave on there with these people. You know, if you, if a guy owes you $3,000, right, maybe you get paid sooner than later and, uh, and yeah, try to really talk to people, get their input, right? Where, what's a good site to play? What's a good agent to play? Because people, it seems like they're still gonna play, right? And so at least try to guide them in the right direction in terms of how to go upon doing it. Just saying, don't play, don't do it, right? I mean, yeah, some people are gonna follow that, but other people aren't gonna follow that too. So I don't think it's a really realistic thing. And we can debate, right? Because, so if, if, if these sites, right, if they're operating outside of, of the legality, right, does that mean that people shouldn't play on them? If if, if, if the games are fair? Mm, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have as big of an issue as some people might like, you know, I think that, you know, you know, I think it's, I think it's important with a lot of laws, you know, on, on, on one hand, you know, it's good to follow the law. And then on the other hand, it's good to understand, you know, why, why laws exist. And it's kind of, you know, with, with, with the, you know, legalization of, of gambling, it's like, there's, there's effectively two factors at hand, you know, one, is that they, you know, spending your time and money on gambling to go to these like offshore companies is like, you know, probably not a great use of someone's time and, you know, not, you know, can be a drain on the American economy. And then the second thing is, you know, that the, the more important factor, I guess, is that, you know, America wants to tax it. And, and, you know, that's, you know, they want, they don't want, you know, other people, yeah, other people kind of draining, uh, draining their funds. So I think that, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, I think that this is definitely, a, you know, a law that exists predominantly, you know, protect yourself, you know, protect you from gambling addiction and prevent, you know, prevent tax dollars from being given to other governments instead of America. But like, uh, that, I, I just don't really, th you know, as far as laws you can break, that seems like one of the, you know, ones that you should be less concerned about, I suppose. So, you know, from like, you know, an ethical standpoint or anything, like I, I definitely don't think, you know, I have absolutely no concerns with people who who choose to go that route. You know, for for me being involved with a gambling company that uh, that does everything by the book, you know, it is it is a little bit annoying seeing <laughs> all the guys who the Wild West guys getting rich kind of thing. But so you know, there's my, maybe I'm being a little bit of a hater, but I do understand people. You know, people they're going to do what they want to do kind of thing, and that you know this kind of you know. Uh, you know, either, you know, gray area or black area gambling or whatnot is, you know, people are, people are going to be doing it. And that's just kind of, you know, kind of, it is, uh, it is the way it is. You know, I think I, I do also, I do think that, you know, something like, okay, so let's say you take, you know, I, I think this is roughly how things are with ACR. Um, you know, I think basically what, what happens is, you know, the, the government of Costa Rica has been, they're one of the countries that's been sort of best in defending their, uh, gaming countries or what, or their gaming companies, where it's like, you know, if you're Costa Rican based, you have Costa Rican license, et cetera. It's like you're, you know, the government of Costa Rica has, you know, has had cases where they basically come forth and they say, the servers are in Costa Rica. The bank accounts are in Costa Rica. This company is in Costa Rica. We operate under Costa Rican law. We don't operate under American law. Hmm. So it's like, you know, if, if America is saying, okay, you're, you know, what you're doing is illegal uh, in America, like, you know, Costa Rica comes back and says, like, there's nothing going on in America, you know, okay, your, your players might be breaking some rules, but like everything you're doing is within our rules, you know, so there's, there's definitely like, so, you know, with something like that, I would feel more okay about it than I would about, you know, a guy, you know, <laughs> living in, living in Nevada, being a competitor to these casinos, you know, you're, you're, he's like these guys running these apps are you know they're threats to guys like Sheldon Adelson who are so powerful and it just seems like I don't know it just seems like they're you know I, I think if you're if, if anybody's making a fuckload of money running these things you know I would I would just be concerned about you know about living in America kind of right. thing so you know I think that I you know I don't know just the amount of dollars that are actually moving 
around this kind of ecosystem. But you know, it seems like if it if it ever gets to be a lot, you know, you, you've got to be uh, concerned, I suppose. Yeah, it's something I've been looking about. You mentioned the ACR thing, looking into it, right? I'm like, well, what's illegal about what they're doing, right? People say it's illegal for these sites, but is it? Like, what what exactly is? I'm going through UIGEA, I'm going through the Wire Act, I'm trying to like what. It seems to me if they're using Bitcoin as one of the primary, but I also hear that there are some, you know, shady things happening where they tell they comes from like a credit card in Singapore or something, you know, it's some weird shit in terms of where these things are going, how cards are getting charged and stuff like that. Now, if you're circumventing a law like that, that's where a lot of these companies went down for. This is why they got in trouble was was for fraud and was for manipulating the system in this sort of way. But if you're only handling the money through Bitcoin, right, but you let American people play, like, it doesn't appear like that's really that. Now, maybe it would it would cost you getting a license in America, right? If you want to get regulated in the future, which is what Rob Young said, if I want to be regulated in America, I can't service American players right now. Well, if ACR is like, fuck it, I don't care. Like, what are they? Yeah, so I, yeah that's yeah, so kind of what I'm I guess wondering. My, my, so my take on that is that from a legal standpoint, I think the only difference between dollars and Bitcoin is that, um, you know, if you're using dollars, you're using some payment processor. You know, you're using you're using Skrill, you're using Luxon, you're using uh, Visa. You know, you're using some pay, pay, PayPal. You're using some payment processor, and that payment processor needs to cover their own ass because they know what's going on is is likely illegal. Mm. And so, so it's like the the different, you know, whether it's whether it's dollars versus Bitcoin, like likely, you know, likely there are some anti-money laundering rules surrounding that. And I think that, you know, I, th- I mean, I think I, I, like if you really if you really comb through the law and look at, you know, what money laundering is and the people who get, you know, put in jail for money laundering, like it, it, it's largely just, you know, it's sort of like this, you know, vague black box that they put they put out there as a way of like arresting people they couldn't arrest for something else. You know, it's like you're you're making too much money off drugs. They never see you selling drugs. They never do anything. Blah 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 blah. Okay, like we'll you know invent this thing called money laundering as something that we can put you in jail for because you know if they can mm. you know almost if I give you if I give you six grand in cash and you didn't look at my passport and stuff like hey, that might be money laundering. You know, it's just like it's such. And if you do that on a big enough scale and it's it's proven that this is most of what your business is like, it's you know, it's pretty easy to get you know arrested for that. So I think it's you know, I think that the there's enough uh, ambiguity out there that I, I think what kind of happens is, you know, if you're on the side of being, you know, a payment processor, you want to cover your own ass so that you can't you know, you don't step on anyone's toes. You don't, you know, piss off your government. You don't piss off any regulators or anything. You know, you just, that's, that's kind of your primary objective. And then, you know, if you're, you know, a site that's knows you're bending some rules and you're doing mostly Bitcoin, it's like your, your issue, the, the thing you've changed isn't what you used to do is illegal and what you're now doing is illegal. It's more just that what you used to do, you can't do, and what you're doing now, you can do. Like you know, if you if you if if you know, if a government really wants to crack down, you know, I think that you know, I don't really think the yeah, I don't think the legality is different. I just think the steps are different. And again, I'm I'm not a lawyer. This is just uh, kind of you know my understanding from you know other people I've this, talked to. This is self quarantine week on on the podcast, Mike. We're locked inside our houses. We're 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 willing to speculate <laughs> on what's going on with this kind of stuff right now, right? I think. Right. Fair Disclaimer. Enough, yeah. Right. Me and Mike are lawyers. Okay. You know we don't. We yeah, don't. we're not lawyers. You know, don't be like, don't don't set up your don't set up some like illegal app and be like, oh no, but Mike Mike said if I take Bitcoin, you know, yeah, yeah, please, you know, please, don't, yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, do, don't, don't don't do don't make any just any business decisions based off of, of me and Mike's discussion on this topic. We're just trying to do a little more clarity here. Richard said it's not the only reason I've worked in anti money laundering. It's about proving when handling money that you're not storing and transferring proceeds of a crime. Banks get done for get done for it all the time interesting yeah like it's like if, if banks touch you know banks just can't you know need to show that they've done proper diligence to you know do everything within their power to yeah not have you know illegal money there and it's just like you know a lot of the steps and checks might be too much for them to you know want to touch gambling businesses mike, mike here's what I, here's what I'm, and what i what i come to after this right is that so we got a lot of people in the community who are massive promoters for these operations that we're not quite sure what's happening on there. We don't really know if there's 
what the security's like on there, right? We, we just got a lot of questions, right? And yeah. now you have some of these big figures in the community who are now the big ambassadors for these sites. So I'm trying to, I, I've, I, I've, I've worked with ACR in the past, right? I've made a couple videos about them. I played a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of hands on there. So I've said, hey, you should check it out before I start realizing like, oh, wait, wait a second, you know, this might not be a good idea. I'm not gonna do that anymore. But a lot of people out there haven't, you know, they haven't gone through that. They don't have that experience. They don't have that knowledge and they're out there promoting the site. Now, what are your thoughts on that, right? Of, of promoting these, these sort of operations out there? Yeah, I mean, it's probably not a good idea. Right. You know, it's just like, like, it's, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's like, uh, you know, I don't think it's like, you know, rocket science uh, to, to, um, to, to guess that, that that's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe something you shouldn't be doing. Uh, I mean, I do think that, you know, I think at the end of the day, a lot of, you know, it's like, it seems to me like there's going to be enough money in this and enough, you know, uh, most people just kind of have a price. And for a lot of people, like, you know, they, this is their, uh, the price is high enough, I suppose. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that, yeah, I mean, it's just, you probably sh like it, it, using an app is one thing, but like, I think, I think promoting these apps, you know, especially, you know, especially, you know, your something like this gets set, you know, whether it's, you know, the people running it, like exit scams, steal a bunch of money or government comes in freezes a bunch of money or you know whatever whatever ends up happening it's just like I, I can't imagine anyone being so involved with this and not thinking oh that's that's a plausible outcome or that's a likely outcome so you know i i think i think you would want to be um very careful i suppose yeah man it's uh you know you, you look out here right and i think you it's so easy to want to do this especially let's say acr app sites you see people out here making a lot of money and they're talking about, I'm an agent, right? I signed up 15 guys. I made I made $7,000 last month. You're like, well, fuck, I kind of, right? Especially as games get tougher. And now as options are taken away, it's just such a, it's such an allure because you only really need to bring in a few guys. And now all of a sudden you're making some passive income that, that right? You don't really have to worry about much. And then from yeah. the higher level size, these guys are printing money. I mean, they're, 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 these guys are crushing it, right? So they're like, oh my God, this is, I can't, I can't believe this, right? Well, yeah, it turns out if you operate the casino, you're probably going to be winning a bunch of money. So from yourself, right, you had the option, right? You could, you didn't ha have to take these steps to make it this illegal operation or this legal enterprise. Why did you decide that, that you want to go ahead and do that with your website poker shares? I just kind of wanted to grow the business and I wanted to sleep easy at night. Yeah. And, you know, I figured that, that was the, that was the way, um, that was the way to do it. You know, I think that, you know, I think it would just be good for my peace of mind. Um, the one comment that I would have from my, my own experience that might be, might be helpful for a lot of people is so for me, you know, I always, I always thought poker stars was the best poker room kind of growing up. Uh, I always thought full tilt was, was number two. And so, you know, I got sponsored by full tilt and even though I was sponsored by full tilt, I was, you know, I always thought, hey, they're the second best. You know, I think Star's the best, Full Tilt's the second best. And then, so when people would ask me, hey, Mike, getting into online poker or thinking of trying out online poker, what site should I deposit at? You know, in the back of my head, I was thinking, oh, Poker Star's the best. But I'd always tell people, okay, go to Full Tilt. You know, it's like, if I were to do this, I would say, yeah, no, Full, full Tilt's where I play, sponsored by them, you know, great game. You know, I would, I would you know, I would be kind of conscious. Like, I, I still thought Full Tilt was great, but I didn't think they were the best. And like their question, if someone asked me what's the best place to play online, the best place I thought the best place to play online was Stars, not Full Tilt. So you see, you know, I was, you know, I was, you know, purely just a representative for the company. I had no no idea the company's finances, no nothing like that. And then Black Friday happens, and Stars pays everyone out, and Full Tilt doesn't. And now I'm sitting here thinking, you know, and I'm over here thinking like I've been, you know, I felt a little bit, you know, like I was like, uh, you know, like the Pied Piper or what, you know, it's like I, I felt like I. I led people to full tilt when, you know, I was, I was leading them to full tilt because full tilt was giving me a paycheck rather than because I thought full tilt was the best. Mm. And, and that kind of changed my perspective where I only really like the idea of, you know, of endorsing something that I believe in endorsing something that I, you know, would want to, uh, yeah, that I, you know, that I would want to be endorsing, even if I wasn't getting paid. And it was just like, you know, eventually like, full tilt paid people like whatever, two years later or something but it was just like during that process I, I was just really 
you know, I just felt like I was, you know, like a phony and I, I just felt bad. And, you know, I, I don't think that I, over the years I encouraged that many people to go to Full Tilt instead of Stars, but I still just kind of had that had that idea in the back of my head. And, you know, with with something like, you know, with something like, you know, one of these apps or whatnot, you know, the, the bad cases can be so much worse and are so much more likely. You know, Full Tilt at that time, it's not like I, I thought they were a shady operation or anything. I thought they were the second best, you know, poker company there was right. and still felt a decent amount of remorse for this. Um, so th that to people out there thinking they might want to run one of these clubs or represent one of these clubs, that would, just kind of from my own experience, I would just say like, it, it sucks feeling like, you know, you're, you know, your cousin and your buddy from high school and, you know, all these people, you know, went and, you know, deposited there and it, you know, didn't, didn't work out and it was your fault. <laughs> kind of thing. So, so yeah, that was, that's, uh, that's my rant there. Yeah, I think that's definitely a similar thing that happened to me with ACR, right? Was that I sent the people there and I, I was like, oh my God, you know, there's some, this is just what I'm seeing happening and what's happening behind the scenes. And I was like, oh man, yeah, that really sucks. You know, and I think that's a big reason why I haven't really wanted to work with many people over the years because I, I if I'm going to send you somewhere, right, I want to send you somewhere I at least believe in. I didn't really understand that until Doug explained to me one time. And he was like, yeah, you know, if you're going to endorse something, right, it should probably be something that that you believe the people that are behind it and you believe in, in whatever the, the product is. And I was like, oh, that's a really good point. Whereas before that, I was like very anti, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to really talk about anything. So, but now it's like, you got to find out what those places are. And I'm trying to find those places to play in poker, right? And mm -hmm. now, because I enjoy an operation or I enjoy a club, right? I, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily endorse other people to want to play there because it's just, who knows what's really happening out there. And I think what the problem is, is that, when you say, yeah, you could play on these sites, well, if it's the right parameters and if you know the Asian, if you know the play, like, there's a lot of ifs you have to go through. There's maybe like 10 ifs. Whereas a person might just say, oh, I heard Joey say that I should go do that and they're going to get fucked. So if yeah. they go to the wrong place and that's that's what really sucks right now is I wish there was a place to just say, hey, Poker Stars Full Tilt. And now I, 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 for yourself, right? I mean, Full Tilt was, right, these guys are on ESPN. These guys are on Poker After Dark. All the biggest names, Phil Ivey, Tom Dwan, Gus Hansen, every respectable person in the poker world was was an ambassador of Full Tilt at the time, even though we would have said, you know, maybe Poker Stars was better. So I, I can understand why you'd have that feeling of, you know, I did something, did something uh, awry. But I mean, at the same time, you know, that, that seemed like one of the most bulletproof companies that existed yeah. that we really knew of. You know what I mean? It, that was pretty astronomical in terms of what happened there. But no, I, I can totally get where you're coming from thinking like, yeah, maybe I really hurt some people that I cared about. But at the same time, right, then maybe you never endorse anything because there's always possibility of something happens with, with things like this. No, that, that is fair. And you've got to draw the lines somewhere or whatnot. Like, you know, I do think endorsing Full Tilt was, yeah, probably one of the, uh, you know, safer things to endorse. Like, it's not like I was it's not like I was endorsing like balance bracelets or, you know, phone guys at the WSOP or, you know, something like that. You know, it's, it could be a lot worse. Uh, one second, I can grab a glass of water. Okay. I do want to talk about the balance bracelets and are we sure the balance bracelets don't work first of all. And second of all, are we sure that the phone charger guys don't have one of the best businesses before now Vegas is closed down, but the phone chargers, I would argue had one of the greatest business strategies of all time. Right? So Mike, the yep. phone charger guys, right? You're not endorsing yep. them, but, they have a phenomenal business, man. There's a mall down the street. I swear to God, they got four locations in there. They got four kiosks in there. And I'm going to tell yeah. you right now, if you see a company that puts four kiosks in a mall, it's not because they're not making a lot of money. It's because they're <laughs> fucking crushing, okay? So yeah. those guys have a very sick, very sick model and have some of the best salesmen I've ever seen. So, you know, shout out to Mark. Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 Yeah, I don't want them harassing people in the hallways. And, like, I'd like there to be a little bit better brand associate at the World Series of Poker. And you don't need to pay $300 for a fucking phone charging case. But from a business perspective, they seem to run a pretty good operation, man. They're kind of crushing it in terms of making money. So I don't know, man. It's it's a fascinating case study, the whole uh, the balance bracelet one. I haven't really touched that one. But are we sure they don't get balanced from that? <laughs> uh, we can be we can be pretty sure. We can be about, okay. about as sure as you are that you're getting ripped off when you buy a phone charger from those guys. I've told you my story about – I've told you my story with them, right? The one where uh, – where they were, I thought they were talking about how many cents it cost, and they were talking how many dollars it cost. Oh my god! When no. Came, when they came out. <laughs> so, what? Okay, so I guess okay. So let, let me. Yeah, I think I might have tweeted this at you, but um, so I go over there. I, you know, my phone dies. I need to get on my phone. Go up to the guy, 
and then ask you know ask him oh how much for uh, you know one of those charger cases and he was like oh uh, they're 4.99 and i'm just like i'm thinking to myself you know Four dollars and ninety nine cents seems too cheap for a phone charger. You know, it's just like you know, it's just like I, you know, I, I just don't really see how it could be only five bucks, but fantastic. <laughs> and then I realized, and he's, but then he, he says, he's like, oh, but you know, I can, I give you a discount for three ninety nine. And I'm like, I, I was, I, I see what's happened here. This is not five dollars. This is five hundred dollars. For a charger case you know i was thinking these things cost 40 bucks or whatnot and i was just thinking like five seems crazy but even if it was five there's no fucking way it's a discount of four okay these are this is four this is four hundred dollars and then and then i'm just i'm like i feel i look like i'm just been like slapped across the face i'm just so so like i just don't get i i, I just don't even have words for him he's like oh you playing the wsop and then i'm like uh yeah. yeah no <laughs> shit no shit that's why i'm here and then he's just like oh you're playing wsp i can give you i give you the wsp discount give it to you for 249 and then i was just like I, i'm just like I'm, I'm i'm sorry aren't these things like aren't these things like 40 bucks you know he's just crazy you know and then he he dropped you know he's uh he asks you know he asks he asks his buddy or his boss or whatnot i think he's, he's like he's like henry like how much you know what's what's the lo- what's the lowest I can go? He goes you know one forty nine or one ninety nine. I'm like hey sorry like I think these I, I think these things are supposed to be one forty bucks. And then he's like or I think these things are supposed to be like forty bucks. Like, oh okay. Uh, do you want to get one of these for forty bucks? And I'm like uh, yeah. And he walks forward. He's like then get your ass down to Walmart. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it got it got so aggro, so aggro. What are you talking about? This happened at the World Series of Poker. Happened at the World Series of Poker. The guy wanted to like fucking fight me because I was asking for a charger at market rate. You know, I, when I thought it was gonna be five dollars, forty dollars seemed so expensive relative to that. It was like you know, it was like. You know, I, I was uh, 40 seemed pricey when I was thinking it was five not long ago. And then, yeah. So that <laughs> your was... ass down to Walmart. <laughs> Get your ass down to Walmart. Holy yeah. fuck, man. I mean, that's, cr- I've never heard anything like that in my life. I mean, listen, so after doing research, I, I do, I, you know, I, you realize how much to get them for, right? It makes sense. That's their, that's their business model. But these things do cost pretty cheap, right? They're, they're not too expensive. Oh, yeah. You know, but then you go to Apple, right? And it's thirty dollars for a cord, you know. But you're like, oh, I'll pay the thirty dollars for a cord. So, what's the difference, right? I don't know. What's the difference in these products? Although Apple, I don't believe they tell you to get down to Walmart for the for the phone charger. So, <laughs> did, did you buy the phone yeah, charger? Think, no, I didn't. I, uh, <laughs> I I just decided to go. Um, I just decided not not to get it not to get it through them. I ended up buying it at some some mall. Um, fashion show mall or I don't know somewhere that it's also overpriced but it it was I mean it was more like it was I think it was maybe 75 there it was definitely more than I expected to spend on this maybe 80 and so it was like after I was like ah 80 like if they were they're willing to give it to me for 150 like at the WSP okay that's not too crazy if I'm spending you know 80 at a normal jacked up mall like I really I really thought I'd look around and find this shit for like 25 bucks or something so you know it was Mike we, we, we were yeah. I hate to tell you this, but the same company owns the ones in the mall too. <laughs> it's the same, I know, yeah, I'm sure I'm it's the sure same it people. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. It is sad. I should have. I should have bought it online. I mean, honestly, it's probably the same people on the online store as well. Really, there's 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 one guy in the world with like a big fucking stocked pile of phone chargers, and no one else can bet if any phone charger you buy is is padding his pocket. Yeah, it's it's these guys on like Alibaba that have they have the the factory in Shenzhen who just mass mass produce all these things and then you talk with them and say okay can you put my logo on there and then they just have this interchangeable logo that they put out there and then you make up a website and you say okay i'm gonna sell them for 400 bucks and then what happens is when when uncle jerry comes in there and uncle jerry needs a phone charger case and you're like "Ah, uncle jerry 200 bucks well uncle jerry doesn't know you can get them for 40 bucks so he pays the 200 dollars. whereas a sharp guy like you is like uh what are you talking about here whereas uncle jerry is like i guess this is just what it is so what happens is obviously here is that the people get taken advantage of and, and maybe that's what 
I guess that's what poker is, right? You you take advantage of the weaker players, and I mean, you know, what's the difference? And and the thing I can tell you, having played with a lot of Uncle Jerry's at the WSOP, you know, I think a lot of the guys that hop in these events, the phone charger was actually a better investment than the poker tournament was for them. So so you know, it's it. They bang, found the bang bang. They, bang. they, Holy they, fuck. Found, they found a they found the right uh, they found the right environment to wow. get. Uh, so, you know, they found where all the Uncle Jerry's, you know, congregate. I mean, to be fair, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying, bang, bang. I mean, that, that's a good point. I mean, this is why po poker shares, right? You make a lot of money off Uncle Jerry's kind of, right? They don't know their Uncle Jerry, though. Yeah, we, we don't mind. You know, we don't mind. We, we have like, you know, VIP discounts for Uncle Jerry's. You know, we treat, we treat, we treat our Jerry's well. You, sure. you, so you, you follow the model, right, with poker shares. Are you taking care of your best customers? Are you... Are you giving them like program? Like, what, how do you handle the idea or think about the idea of, of treating the best customers? All right, so I'll, uh, we treat our customers well. We treat our okay. So, <laughs> what do you do? What do you, well, you're smiling. <laughs> what do you what are you giving them? Lambos and stuff I mean, like I'll, that. I'll give an I'll give an example about how how well Poker Shares keeps uh, treats their best customers. All right, so so my business partner he used to live uh, he used to live in London, England, and you know one of our you know, one of our, you know, one of our best, uh, one of our best VIPs, he was, you know, in London, you know, they had, you know, it's like, you know, my business partner is, you know, effectively, you know, CEO of the poker shares. It's like, you know, they, you know, hasn't met one of our top customers or whatnot. And, you know, says like, oh, you know, we should, you know, we should grab, you know, we should grab like dinner or something like that. And then the, you know, the guy's like, oh, you know, when I'm, you know, when I'm out in, you know, tonight I can't do dinner, but you know, we're going out, we're going out to this place called the box. Have you ever heard of the box or no? Where's the box? No. Uh, so there's, I think there's one in New York City. There's one in London. They're in a few different cities. It's like, okay. it's basically like a nightclub slash sex club slash. It's a very I think all in. sorts of like <laughs> no, crazy, crazy kinky sex acts going on or whatnot. Okay. So you know my 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 business partner. He's not. He's married. He's not a partier. His wife, you know, I think is you know religious, very conservative, like not someone who would ever go to you know like a nightclub let alone let alone go to the box so then they go down go to this place and it's like you know people are people are running around like naked you know there's all there's all sorts of you know everybody's got their shirts off it's just like a total crazy environment you know basically you know my business partner is buying up you know champagne for the whole room getting the whole bill you know we spent like spent like a nine grand bill uh just catering uh catering to one of our vips and just you know you know, bill it to poker shares or whatnot. We, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're very, you know, when, when someone gives us good action, we'll, you know, we'll, uh, we kind of are, you know, we're a bit of a concierge service in some ways, I suppose. So when, you know, when, when someone's big action for us, we'll, you know, we're, we're happy to, you know, pick up the bill, treat them well, you know, etc. So what, 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 what happens at the box, right? So you, is it just people are dancing and that's it? They got the shirts off or, or, so i mean i i haven't been and you know uh -huh. hearing it allegedly. from you know basically my allegedly, my, pardon, allegedly. No, I've, I've, I've honestly never been my allegedly. so my okay. business partner's wife you know was pretty kind of uncomfortable in this environment you know she's you know never seen something like this you know people you know you know all the girls running around with you know with their with their shirts off and stuff like that like it's definitely uh yeah i mean and then you watch you watch different kind of like you know sex shows on stage and stuff like i I, this this must have been a couple of years back, so I can't remember uh, I can't remember all the details associated with it, but it's definitely you know as far as uh, you know a, a, a purchase a, a company might make for their uh, for their VIPs, this might be an unconventional one, I suppose. I love it, man. That sounds like you, you guys are really taking care of. The, I like it. I think if you're out there and you're wondering if you should sign up on Poker Shares, that's all you need to know, right? They're going to take care of you. And, yeah, okay. uh, we we you know we we take care of our customers. That's for sure. Let's, uh, I, know we're, I know we're trying to keep this about an hour for the people up there, plus my OBS is kind of freaking out here. Let's come in, let me go through what I got on here. So do you have any bets kind of, uh, any big bets you got going on right now? Anything you're paying attention to the most? Mm, yeah, I'd say, I'd say, you know, I don't, like, I don't even know if I could win money at Play Money PLO. Like, I really have no idea how to handicap the best players in the world playing against each other. So we really just let, you know, the market push that one around and try to keep a relatively balanced book. So that, that's been... That, I think that's been one of the most popular markets we've ever had on the site. We've, we've had so much wagered on the uh, the Gelfon challenge, mm -hmm. and there's just so much uncertainty. It's such an ongoing thing. It's exciting the whole time. 
Um, it's nice seeing there be a recovery. Like it would have been a little depressing if the if the loss if the you know the bleeding never stopped. Um, but yeah, it's been you know that's been that's been big for our our company, and it's also been it's been uh, I would say somewhat eye opening as well. Where I think that you know at the end of the day, when you look at you know I mean this should be such an intuitive thing, but when you look at betting on a sports game, you know if one team's you know if the if the Lakers are playing the Warriors or something like that, like obviously that's just not that fun to gamble on who's going to win between the Lakers and the Warriors. So of course you add, you know, over unders, you add, you know, you add a spread so that you can have these sort of one-to-one bets where you bet on something and you'll roughly double your money. You don't have one team at plus 1000, the other team at minus 2000, you know, it's just, nobody really likes either of those bets, but when you find things that are about 50, 50, people can like both sides of those bets. And that's something we've been finding in terms of uh, the interest of our users. They really, you know, with the politics betting and then with the Gelfon challenge, it's like, this has been, it's been driving uh, a much higher percent of our traffic than we originally anticipated. So the kind of, you know, we're realizing, and again, this should have been obvious that like, there's a reason the traditional sports book model works so well. So we're, we're, as time goes on, you know, we're, we're adding more and more uh, products to our site. You know, we're, you know, we added dice, we're going to add a casino, you know, we're, we're just kind of gradually, uh, adding uh, more things there, likely add sports at some time, at some point, that, that might be one of the later ones. But, you know, you, you realize, like, you know, why why the most successful gambling businesses do the things they do, I suppose. Yeah, makes sense. Sorry, guys, it, it, my OBS did drop off there, so you kind of didn't catch a little bit of that. Mike was talking <laughs> about um, uh, the, the political race and he betting against Trump, and then he was talking about the Galthon Challenge and just talked about how the Galthon Challenge brought in a lot of new people. And I guess the idea would be is that you leverage what events are going on and you you make a market, even if you don't take a lot of money on it, you generating the market creates the discussion. It creates the content on its own right there. And from that, people want to go check out what's happening. So, and also what, I mean, basically what you can do is you can just study the uh, the other sports bet- sports markets and say, well, what do they do to drive traffic? Like, what is my bookie doing to drive traffic? And, and you can emulate these strategies and then put your own spin on them too. It's very very kind of, uh, I don't know how much time you really spend on, on researching sort of other businesses that are maybe not even in your industry, but kind of do a similar thing. But that's basically what I do all the time. It's just, I'm always researching what other people are doing in other industries because you find out some good ideas. But yeah, you mentioned Galathon Challenge, right? It's just, it's, it's people are, in, they want to, they don't understand some of these things that are happening. So it's good to have some more information and, and with a line, you can say, okay, well, well, poker shares has it at plus this. So now I know a little bit more in my head as the customer, as like the viewer of, of a challenge or of a bet or whatever. Whereas mm. before you, you might not know, well, I don't, is Phil going to win? Yeah. He seems like a favorite. Oh wait, poker shares has him, you know, plus whatever, plus 335. Okay. Well, he's not. So mm. I think that's really informative and, and, and it's something that you can really use to, to draw appeal to your site, right? Just kind of anything like that. And obviously influencer marketing is one of the most popular things and, and advertising on, on products or where the demographic that you're trying to reach is there, right? It's kind of obvious things, but I think now you're starting to realize, okay, maybe, maybe there is something there, right? Bring in the, the people who like politics and let's try to keep them around for the casino and for the sports and for these other things like that too. So it seems like you're kind of on a really good track and, and taking it slow, but you know, we know the operators win, right? So you're, it seems like you're, you're building a pretty good business over there with what you're doing. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of something that we've realized. Like especially especially live tournaments, you know, you you hop to poker shares, you keep a balance on poker shares, but then it, it takes two days or five days or whatnot for a market to settle because it takes so long. Whereas you know, it's nice having stuff on the platform that keeps people engaged. You know, like you know, casino type stuff is super fast, but then also you know, betting on you know, betting on daily events like will Phil Gelfond win today. You know, it's just like it's nice. You're you're tuning into the broadcast. You're you're watching this, and you bet on you know which which player is going to win that session. And it's like that's been popular for us. It's actually I I had a tweet about this recently. We've been doing slightly better since then. But in the first 18 sessions of the Gelfon Challenge, we lost money on 17 of them. Wow, which is pretty which is pretty crazy. Where it's just like you know the the market ended up always. Uh, guessing right i suppose so, <laughs> so it was like you know yeah I, I had uh i had kind of you know that like picture of like the horse where the horse starts out looking so nice like that someone drawing a horse and by the end the horse is super ugly yeah yeah i used i made some, we made some like meme i saw that, about one, yeah, that saw regarding that yeah regarding like handicapping this where it's you know literally 
you know, every session except for one, we've lost money there, which is which is pretty funny. Um, I think since then, maybe there's been five more and we've won two out of five since then or something. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, yeah, it's been, you know, you, it's, it's kind of funny watching, you know, watching how these things play out, but having, uh, having like, yeah, just having like quicker markets, you know, someone was telling me one of the big things when you're, you know, when you're, uh, when you're taking football bets is, you know, you have your one o'clock games, uh, or one o'clock Eastern, whatever, 10 a.m. Pacific. And it's like, if you're one o'clock games, those markets can be settled before the 4.30 game. Like if, if people can have the money in their account, your sports book does so much better where it's like some bookies are too slow to settle one o'clock games that you don't have money in your account to bet in time for the 4.30 game or 4.30 games. And it's like, that's, that's a huge factor where it's like, you know, you lose customers. If like they, if they know they can go somewhere else and they can bet four thirty, just like it, li and it literally just comes down to like minutes. Where some people get a few minutes after four thirty, some get it a few minutes before four thirty because these games wow. they you know they end at four twenty or four twenty five or something like that. And just being able to really quickly settle it, it drives action. And you know for finding finding poker related things people want to bet on that don't take a week or a month or whatnot to settle is uh, is helpful. And that's an, another thing that we've been learning. I wonder if there's a way, right? So how do you solve that problem? I wonder if there's a way to say for somebody out there who wants to bet those earlier games to say, okay, the incentive is that you either get a better price or you get some sort of bonus for sticking around here and betting on this site. And it'll retain some percentage of the customer that way, right? Like, like make it an exclusive sort of deal just for that person. So now you have incentive to bet the one o'clock game but you also get something bonus for the four o'clock game. So what you might get is a customer who bets two different spots, whereas before mm -hmm. they might not have bet zero spots. So I, I wonder if anything like that is even is even worthwhile to consider in terms of like a, a special way to even if it, maybe it's a necessary right. Maybe you you get to a scale where you don't really even need to worry about things like that. But that would kind of be I, I would try to figure out what the answer to that problem is outside mm -hmm. of how do I get the money in their account faster, right? What can I how can I incentivize them to stick around with that money? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think just I, I think the main thing is just having good software, um, mm. and then yeah, I mean, it, it be trying to improve beyond that. I think is yeah important as well. But I think once once you have fast enough software, that's that's eighty percent of the fight. That's I the think. main. That's the main yeah. thing. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, we get you know, and it's, especially if you're if you're even one minute faster than someone else, you know, if you just have a game whether it goes to overtime or just. You know, drags out a little longer and just happens to go until 427 okay well maybe one you know one or two games uh per season you're you're going to be faster than the competitor who's one or two minutes slower to settle than you and now you you get you know people talk about this people are ranting on forums that this other site is too slow like i think i think fast software is is there is the is, is, is the big thing where because people they bet their full account balance and they want to go press when they're winning and they just want that money in their account and then they're you know, they went all in for 150 bucks, doubled up. They want to go all in for 300. And, you know, especially when you're paying out winning bet, like when it comes to winning bets, it's not like you're losing out on half your action when you're you're losing it on like two thirds because the winners all want to go bet. Kind mm -hmm. of thing. So it's, and they're probably going to bet more. That's a good so point. It's, yeah. <sighs> all right, guys. I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm going to, I want to keep Mike too long. I know Mike's got things to do. You guys got things to do out there. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Shout out to my guys from Live at the Bike, Taylor Carroll out there in the chat, American legend. Bluff caught Mike Posso, man. We're never going to forget that moment in time. My man, Patrick Curran, of course. Uh, Wayne Chiang's out there as well. My guy, Landon Tice, in the chat. My girl, Shelby, helping out. I see Crush Live Poker. Shout out to Crush Live Poker as well to everybody in the chat, everybody on Twitch, everybody on YouTube. You guys are awesome. Smash that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the podcast. Please let us know what you thought below. Mike, be following along. If you want to follow Mike on Twitter, it's at, just put search Mike McDonald. You're going to find him on there as well. And uh, yeah, man, if you want to stay up to date on what's happening with the markets and with coronavirus and any sort of betting, Mike is your fucking guy to follow for all those things up there. He's been very active on Twitter lately. And we're all on house arrest. So, uh, so yeah, tomorrow <laughs> I'm going to be back with a new video on uh, it. This is the guide for American players how to play poker. This is the definitive. You send this to anyone that says, where should I play? I want, I want you to be able to send, watch this and do it. So that's it, guys. Peace out. Take care. Mike, talk to you soon, brother. It's a good chat to you. You too, man. Later, guys.